This video covers the key concepts of the respiratory system. In the video, we will look at the structure of the respiratory system, the mechanism of ventilation, gaseous exchange at the alveoli, and how to measure lung volumes and ventilation rate. The respiratory system is responsible for gaseous exchange to supply oxygen to the body's cells for aerobic cellular respiration and to excrete carbon dioxide, the waste product of aerobic cellular respiration. This diagram shows the main structures of the respiratory system. Here are the left and right lungs, housed within the thoracic cavity and protected by the rib cage. See how the heart is in between the lungs. This reduces the distance that deoxygenated blood needs to travel from the heart to the lungs and the distance for the oxygenated blood to get back to the heart to be pumped all around the body, allowing for efficient gaseous exchange. Here you can see the trachea that carries the air between the mouth and the lungs. It has horseshoe-shaped rings of cartilage to keep it open. There are goblet cells and ciliated epithelial cells lining the trachea. The goblet cells produce mucus to trap dust particles, bacteria, pollen and other such foreign objects. The cilia then waft the mucus up to the back of the throat where it is swallowed. This helps reduce infections of the lungs. The trachea then branches into the left and right bronchi. This is the plural name, one on its own would be called a bronchus. The bronchi lead into the left and right lungs. The bronchi branch into bronchioles and as these stretches get narrower and narrower, the cartilage becomes more and more irregular and eventually disappears. At the end of the smallest bronchioles are the alveoli, tiny air sacs where the gaseous exchange occurs. The whole structure is like an upside down tree with the trachea like the trunk, the bronchi like the main branches, the bronchioles are the smaller branches and the alveoli are the leaves. The lungs are designed specifically for gaseous exchange. An efficient diffusion relies on a large surface area, short diffusion distance and steep concentration gradient. So let's look at how the lungs provide these. We will start with ventilation, which is the movement of the thorax to get air into and out of the lungs. This supply of oxygen to the lungs and removal of carbon dioxide helps maintain a steep concentration gradient for gaseous exchange. During inhalation, the external intercostal muscles contract while the internal intercostal muscles relax, lifting the ribs up and out. At the same time, the diaphragm contracts and flattens downwards, which is enabled by the abdominal muscles relaxing to make space. This raising of the ribs and flattening of the diaphragm increases the volume inside the thorax. The lungs follow the thorax because the pleural membranes lining the ribs and outside of the lungs adhere the two together. As the volume increases, the pressure decreases, so as the mouth opens, air containing higher levels of oxygen rushes into the lungs down the pressure gradient. During exhalation, the external intercostal muscles relax and the internal intercostal muscles contract, pulling the ribs down and in. At the same time, the diaphragm domes upwards as it relaxes and is pushed up by the contracting abdominal muscles. The dropping of the ribs and the doming of the diaphragm decreases the volume inside the thorax, thereby decreasing the volume of the lungs. Hence the pressure increases and the air carrying the higher concentration of carbon dioxide rushes out of the lungs as the mouth opens. Here is a diagram of gaseous exchange in the alveoli. This oxygen brought in by the inhaled air dissolves in the moist lining of the alveoli and diffuses from the inside of the alveoli, where it is in higher concentration, into the blood, where it is in lower concentration, down its concentration gradient. It then binds to the haemoglobin inside the red blood cells to be carried all around the body to the respiring cells. The carbon dioxide collected from the respiring cells is in higher concentration inside the blood than inside the alveoli, so this diffuses from the blood into the alveoli down its concentration gradient. Exhalation then lowers the concentration of carbon dioxide inside the lungs again. Diffusion across the alveoli is efficient as the many millions of alveoli provide a large surface area. A dense network of capillaries also surrounds the alveoli and the blood is constantly flowing. 
so as soon as oxygen has diffused into the blood, it is carried away, maintaining a steep diffusion gradient. If you look at the diagram, you can see two types of cells in the alveolar walls, type 1 and type 2 pneumocytes. The type 1 pneumocytes are flattened, which means there is a short distance across which the gases have to diffuse. This short diffusion distance between the alveoli and blood is also due to the capillary walls being only one cell thick. The type 2 pneumocytes secrete surfactant, which reduces the surface tension of the moist layer lining the alveoli to prevent the water molecules from being attracted to each other by hydrogen bonding and leading to the walls sticking together. Spirometers are a type of apparatus that can measure lung volume. They can be the simple ones used by students in the lab, like this one here. To measure the tidal volume, the subject puts a nose clip on so that the only air movement is through the mouth. The subject then breathes in and out through the mouthpiece. As they breathe out, it increases the volume of air in the chamber of the spirometer, and as the subject breathes in, the volume decreases. The carbon dioxide breathed out by the subject is absorbed by the soda lime in this chamber, so that the subject does not breathe in air with greater and greater concentration of carbon dioxide, as that would not be very good for them. Because carbon dioxide is being removed by the soda lime in this drum, the volume of the air in the chamber reduces little by little. In hospitals and research laboratories, computer-based spirometers are used where the computer produces the trace as a person breathes in and out of the mouthpiece. This is the type of trace you would get from a spirometer. When looking at spirometer traces, look at what the y-axis says. Here, you can see it refers to the volume of air in the spirometer. As a person breathes in, the volume of air in the spirometer will reduce. Therefore, as the trace goes down here, the person is breathing in. As the trace goes up, the person is breathing air back into the spirometer through exhalation. So that is one breath, one inhalation and one exhalation. This part of the trace shows a person breathing at rest. The volume of air inhaled or exhaled in one breath at rest is known as the tidal volume. If you finish taking your normal breath in at rest and then breathe in as much as possible, this is your inspiratory reserve volume, as shown here on the trace. Then, if you finish your breath out at rest and then breathe out as much as you possibly can, this is your expiratory reserve volume, as shown here. If you are then asked to inhale as much as you can and then exhale as much as you can, the volume exhaled is known as your vital capacity. So the vital capacity is the inspiratory reserve volume plus the tidal volume plus the expiratory reserve volume. We mentioned earlier that soda lime absorbs the carbon dioxide in some spirometers, which gradually reduces the volume of air in the tank. This can be seen by this gradual downward slope. You can also use spirometer traces to measure the ventilation rate or breathing rate. This is the number of breaths a person takes in one minute. If you are asked to work this out from a trace, look for a nice steady rate on the trace. We can use this area here. So if we went to 30 seconds, we could double the number of breaths to get breaths per minute. So we need to draw a line up from the 30 seconds. Going to naught seconds then, it starts at the end of an exhalation. So this is an inhalation followed by an exhalation, which is one breath. Then an other inhalation followed by an exhalation, so a second breath. This is a third breath and this is a fourth. This makes five breaths, this makes six breaths and then this last trough is half a breath. So that gives us six and a half breaths. If we double this, it gives us a ventilation rate of 13 breaths per minute. In conclusion, the respiratory system is responsible for the exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide between the blood and alveoli. The trachea and bronchi carry air into and out of the lungs and the bronchioles carry air to and from the alveoli. The thorax is the upper part of the body above the abdomen. As its volume changes, air is drawn into or expelled from the lungs. Contraction of external intercostal muscles in the diaphragm bring about inhalation. Contraction of internal intercostal muscles and relaxation of the diaphragm bring about exhalation. Tidal volume is the volume inhaled or exhaled at rest in one breath. The inspiratory reserve volume is the volume that you can inhale above inhalation at rest. 
The expiratory reserve volume is the volume that you can exhale above exhalation at rest. And the vital capacity is the tidal volume plus the inspiratory reserve volume plus the expiratory reserve volume. And that is the end of this key concept video on the respiratory system.